afternoon and thank you so much for being here for our pitch fest this afternoon. My name is Mary Dawson, I'm the program director of River Run. Um, before we get started, I do just want to take a few moments to thank um, a number of our sponsors. Um, it's a big feat putting on a festival of this magnitude and we wouldn't be able to do it without the help of so many people. I'd like to thank our 2023 presenting sponsors, the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, the City of Winston-Salem, the Arts Council of Winston-Salem and Forsyth County and the Millennium Fund. They've been tremendous supporters of this festival for many years, so we really thank them for their continued support. Um, but I am very excited today to be introducing Pitch Fest. This is one of our favorite things that we do every year, um, and it's just grown and gotten more exciting every year. So I'm very happy to be here, and mostly I'm here just to introduce our incredible moderator, Neil Charnoff from WFDD. Um, Neil Charnoff joined 88.5 WFDD as the Morning Edition host in 2014. He previously hosted All Things Considered at Vermont Public Radio for 14 years. He was raised in the Catskill region of upstate New York. Um, sorry, he graduated from Sarah Lawrence College in 1983 when filmmakers were editing their Super 8 films with razor blades. <laughs> He's armed with a liberal arts degree. Neil was fully equipped to be a waiter. So he prolonged his arrested development bouncing around New York and LA until discovering that people enjoyed listening to his voice on the radio. Neil now sees the value of that liberal arts degree and approaches life with the knowledge that all subjects and all art forms are connected to each other. We are very happy to have Neil Charnoff moderating today. So please welcome him up to the stage. Hi, thank you so much. I'm so humbled um, to be with you all today. Um, I, you know, I come from the world of journalism where it's often said we are responsible for writing the first draft of history. Um, documentary filmmakers then come along and you apply your creativity and your personal vision and then tell those stories and really get to the essence of those stories. Um, and I look forward to hearing about your stories um, today. Uh, just some quick business to get out of the way. I um, want to first introduce the uh, jurors on the panel today. And um, if I mispronounce anybody's name, by the way, let me know. I, uh, being in public radio, I get a half point off my radio license every time I mispronounce something. So, um, But we are uh, very happy to have on our panel Nicole Yore is the coordinating producer for National Productions at PBS North Carolina. She's worked in film and television for 15 years, various production roles at HBO, Fox, and on Broadway before entering the world of public media. She's produced multiple series for PBS Digital Studios, including the award-winning doc series Overview, and works with independent producers and filmmakers at PBS NC to shepherd their projects through the local and national public media system. Um, I have made my pledge, by the way, to your public uh, service, um, which we appreciate. Whoops. Uh, I've broken the festival. Um, um, Molly Bourne is a journalist and producer based in Charleston, West Virginia, working across several forms of media, telling stories in and about Appalachia and working with audio and moving image archival material. Recently, she produced King Cole, a hybrid documentary directed by Oscar-nominated filmmaker Elaine McMillan Sheldon. That premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in January to rave reviews. It's currently being screened at River Run. And as a reporter, Molly is a two-time Livingston Award finalist. Uh, she uh, produced a award-winning podcast for the, uh, named a podcast for the pandemic era by the New York Times during uh, the pandemic. Uh, as a producer, she's worked on projects commissioned by Frontline, The Marshall Project, and Netflix, and is currently the Mellow Fellow in Journalism at Denison University in Granville, Ohio, uh, where she teaches and advises student journalists covering the community. And also, uh, rounding out our panel is Christopher Everett, an independent film director, producer, and curator based in Wilmington, North Carolina. Christopher is the program manager at the Southern Documentary Fund, is the founder of Speller Street Films, and is a recent Firelight Media Doc Lab fellow, currently a guest film curator at the Cary Theater in Cary, North Carolina. His debut feature documentary, Wilmington on Fire, chronicles the 1898 Wilmington Massacre, and he's currently in post-production on Wilmington on Fire Chapter 2, and also Grandmaster the Vic Moore Story, which looks at the life and teachings of martial arts pioneer Grandmaster Victor Moore. He's also currently in production on We Built This, profiles of 
black builders and architects in North Carolina. And uh, once again, I'm uh, humbled to be in your company. Thank you so much for being here. Finally, uh, the uh, rules uh, for Pitch Fest. Um, in terms of what's going to happen, uh, prior to each individual pitch, students will have up to 90 seconds of footage from their project screened for you. Uh, then students will have up to five minutes to pitch their project. The jurors will have up to 10 minutes for follow-up questions. We'll have a little panel to explore uh, the student's pitch. Once all those are completed, uh, the jurors will have a short deliberation period to choose the two winners. Uh, jurors then come back, we'll give some short feedback uh, and uh, welcome advice, I'm sure, to all students who pitched and then we'll announce the first and second place winners. Uh, that's how things are gonna work, so let's get right to it with our very first pitcher. Bella Zerillo is here from Appalachian State University and she's going to talk, uh, <laughs> going to talk about uh, uh, the film Hugo Ever After, so welcome Bella. Hello everybody, my name is Bella Zarillo and I'm here to share and pitch with you the amazing Hugo Ever After story. This story is a short 15 to 20 minute documentary and will be about a very special and inspiring man, my very own father, who is in the crowd tonight. Give it away. It is a story about his 17 year long career as the NBA mascot, Hugo the Hornet. It is about his sex, su successes, excuse me, and laughable moments, his hardships, and the effect of those hardships on our family before, during, and after his career. But at its core, it is about the highs and lows of the coolest job in the world and the pursuit to discover after the job, after the suit of Hugo is worn for the very last time, after everything is done, was it all worth it? For this very inspirational and intriguing story, I cho chose the format, chose to do the format into a three distinctive acts. The first act will be about my father becoming Hugo and a sneak peek from his perspective into what being an NBA mascot was like. Also within this act, I would like to interview people and mascots from the NBA and possibly even some players and let them give more of a context of what it was like back then. Yes, all the mascots are friends and yes, they are all wildly entertaining within and without the suit. <laughs> within the second act, I plan to interview members of my fam family focusing specifically on my mother, brother and myself in order to get their and my thoughts and feelings about my father's career when he was still in it. The third act will consist of interviews with my father and family about how my father's career successes and hardships affect all of them and myself. Focusing on the key question of this entire documentary, was it all worth it? The audience for this short documentary is honestly everybody. However, there are some targeted groups of people that I'm sure will either have a very keen or personal interest. And they are NBA fans, gymnastics fans, Hornets fans, and North Carolina residents. Because who here has heard of the uh, Charlotte Hornets? Anybody? <laughs> and that's a lot of people, exactly. I've had the added bonus within the story, as most of everyone involved is my family. And I love my family, and I know they love me, and are just excited about the story as I am and will do anything they can to aid in this production. For everyone who is not family, they are either friends of my father's time as a mascot or know of him. And this is a very big plus when it comes to not only exposure, but access to footage and other important resources. Because as I'm sure you all understand, it's not about who you know, but who knows you. <laughs> I'm cur currently working out the details in regards to B-roll footage and I plan to show this doc that I plan to show in this documentary. At this point, I do not know who exactly owns the mascotting footage, but I am in the process of finding out. In regards to equipment, I'm currently an App State student and can rent out cameras for free, which is amazing. And I plan to be a student for as long as the production goes on. Finally, this story is entertaining, hilarious, raw, unique, and triumphant 
It's the journey of a man and his family's life through the highs and lows of a uniquely interesting and taxing career. It deserves to be shared. The reason I entered into this pitch fest, reason I entered into this pitch fest is because I know the story and I know that it deserves to be shared. Thank you very much. Is it time for questioning? <laughs> uh, that was a good pitch, good pitch. Um, I was curious, um, in regards to the B-roll, the, you know, the archival footage and everything, I know you say you're working on finding you know, who owns the rights and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I know how it is as a filmmaker, you know, tracking this stuff down is tough. It, um, yes. <laughs> so have you thought about, do you have like a backup plan just in case um, you can't get access to some of that stuff? Do you have kind of like a backup plan of how you want to maybe show some of the visuals or anything? Yes, I do actually. If uh, the B-roll footage cannot be used, um, I'm going to focus more on the effect on after um, because unfortunately, as I'm sure you all know, licensing can be a tricky um, thing to go about. And uh, I'm not relying solely on that to share this story. Great pitch. And um, <laughs> I love archival footage. So this seems to be, I mean, I just, there's so much material to work with here. Oh, tons. I had, <laughs> yeah, I had two questions. Um, I th we've seen those licensing it's a challenge to license this material, but also it's getting more and more expensive. So I wondered how you might um, consider funding the purchase of the license and licensing this material, like if, if that's come into to play. And then um, also you said you, this was a 10 to 15 minute, or sorry, yeah, 10 to 20 minute film as you envision it now. Um, how many um, former mascots and, and NBA people do you think you you would interview would would you have enough time in a 10 to 15, 10 to 15 20 minute format to to fit all that in yeah well um let me focus on the first part of the question first um for uh funding i was thinking of um either setting up sort of a gofundme or asking the community around me because i know there's a lot of hornets fans there's a lot of people who want this story to be shared and i think um people would like to support it with dollars as well. Um, and when I got to, if I ever get to that issue, I'm sure it will be dealt with um, from the fan base and notoriety that I already have with the story. Um, for the second part of the question, um, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, lights. So <laughs> 10, to, 10 to 20 minutes was the length that you envisioned, but you have a lot of people that you need to talk to in that time frame. Yes. So I'm wondering how, um, um, I guess how you might encounter, how you might, uh, that seems to be a challenge, right? Like yeah. to fit all those interviews in, uh, how will you do that, do you think, in the time frame you have? Yeah, and I think to keep the interview short and sweet, definitely, it wouldn't, wouldn't be more than maybe two minutes within the documentary, just to kind of get the faces that people know already in there and kind of entice them with what they already know to give them what they don't. Um, and I think that having those, I know that my father has a lot of connections uh, within that realm. He's actually really good friends, like, from the get-go with uh, a lot of those mascots and um, some prospective players. So I think keeping it short and sweet and making sure that that is not the main focus of the documentary is going to help in really pushing forth the story. Hi. Hello. I'm curious, are you editing, or do you have another editor in mind? I am editing, yes. I'm, I'm currently working on going through all of the B-roll footage because there is a lot, and it's all kind of um, from the 90s, so it's on um, different CDs, and um, I'm working to get all of those files from the CDs into digital form, and that's a little tricky, but I mean, from the 
short excerpt that you saw, um, it's working out. Also curious because your pitch had a lot of personal footage in it. Do you think you have enough personal footage to fill in for some of the stuff that you might have to license? Yes, yes, and I think I'm, I'm currently working on getting more and more personal footage. There's, there were a lot, he had a very big sphere of people around him at that time, and a lot of people have opinions on it, mm -hmm. um, not only within my family, but in the people that worked around him, and they can really flesh out some of those innermost details, and for a 15 to 20 minute or 10 to 20 minute documentary, I feel that that would be very much aided. Um, in regards to the, uh, you know, based off of that and hearing your pitch, uh, what type of style do you kind of want this documentary to be? Are you looking more of a verite type of style or you want to kind of do, you know, talk, talking heads or you want to kind of do like a mixture? Um, you know, and also the music choice as well like how, how do you want to how do you want to have music kind of play in, in this project as well yeah i really like that question because i've thought a bunch about this on this project um and what i've kind of come up with is that i want it to be a very um continual story a very um continuity is going to be a big thing so it's going to start off kind of how it started off um back then when everything was just beginning it's um, great, it's fun, it's laughable, it's hilarious at times. And then um, with multiple interviews, um, some voiceover in there, of course. Um, but yeah, a mix of talking heads and other things. Um, and the music will kind of go along with the mood of each act. I think in the beginning it's going to be, I know, that I wanted to have the song Mone Mone play because that was his famous song when he was running up and dunking all the baskets, but um, obviously licensing, copyright, but something along that aspect. Within the second act, it's getting a little bit more serious. Um, so having more of a, not somber, but a serious tone to it. And then towards the end, a very culmination of everything and it's just the resolution. So making sure that the music matches the mood is going to be a very important thing. Because in my opinion, music can drive a documentary. Yeah. I was just going to ask one more question. I, I think it can be really challenging to interview members of your family and those close to you, especially when it might involve you know, having to talk about how challenging this was for you guys growing up. Um, have you thought about how you might set up these interviews with those closest to you when it gets to a hard subject? Yeah, yeah. And again, very important question because uh, a lot of people have asked me, some of my professors um, have been like, well, you are very close to this story and there's no denying that. Um, but I think since we all went through the same thing and we had to get through different difficult spaces, I think there's um, some openness there and I want to make sure that I'm not exploiting that um, and I'm gonna have some people that are not as <laughs> personally involved kind of help in that and be bounce ideas off of like, okay, Am I getting to the nitty gritty of it? Am I going too far? I need an outside opinion, a bouncing board, and I plan to have many of those within this project. Do you have a really f firm idea of how you want the resolution to play out, or are you hoping to be surprised? Um, I have a small idea, but most of it is going to be surprise in the end. And I think that's what makes some of the best documentaries is that element of surprise because I honestly don't know where it could lead. I have a general idea, but until I get there, I can't speak on that. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, 
That was Bella Zarillo from Appalachian State University. Um, thank you, Bella. Um, next, we welcome from Elon University, Emily Prinz. And Emily's going to talk about the film Not Without a Trace. Mary Peters and Kathy Weeks Kingama weren't able to find Dee Dee Peters on that February evening, nor were police able to locate her in the days and the weeks that followed, nor were detectives able to provide answers in the years that followed. And soon enough, Dee Dee Peters was added to a list of names that no mother wants to see their child end up on, the list of missing person cold cases. Now, 40 years later, residents of the suburban area around Grand Rapids, Michigan, are still haunted by one question. How can a 14-year-old girl just disappear, seemingly without a trace? I heard about Dini Peters' story from my dad, who was also a teenager in Grand Rapids in 1981, and to this day still remembers the searches and the rumors that circulated after the disappearance, even years later when he moved down to North Carolina to raise his family. I grew up hearing Dini's story, which was used as a warning from my parents that Sometimes bad things happen to innocent young women, and you always need to keep an eye out because danger can sometimes lurk around every corner. As I got older and my love for documentary storytelling grew in my classes as a cinema and television arts major at Elon University, I kept on coming back to Dini's story and how much it impacted my dad, and I started to get interested in how it also impacted other residents of Grand Rapids. This interest eventually grew in the, into the 14-minute documentary, Not Without a Trace, which I'm currently in completing for my BFA thesis project and is in the stages of post-production. This film goes beyond the typical scope of the true crime genre. Instead of focusing on the grim details and the various rumors surrounding the Dini's disappearance, the instead, the focus is on her legacy and how her disappearance has continued to impact the Grand Rapids community. It was important for me to attempt to mitigate further harm by making this documentary so I conducted undergraduate research on ethical practices in documentary filmmaking as a part of my honors thesis. And I also, that resulted in an ethical guide for student filmmakers, which I worked on. Last summer, I traveled up to Grand Rapids, Michigan and started to speaking to people about Dini's story. I spoke to Brent Ashcroft, a local journalist whose voice underscores many nightly news stories about Dini and also created a Facebook page uh, boasting almost 5,000 people who still share stories of Dini and theories about what happened to her. I talked to uh, Kathy Weeks Kema, Dini's friend, who to this day is terrified for her granddaughter who just turned 14 years old, the same age as Dini was when she disappeared. I also talked to Elizabeth Serranis, a fellow classmate of Dini's who um, talked about how strange it felt to suddenly have to go search in her small suburban town in fields and um, fields looking for a body. And I talked to Sally Walter, the current head of the Kent County Metro Cold Case team, who shared her frustration with individuals who, despite 40 years and promises of legal immunity, still refuse to reveal where her remains are housed. And I talked to Mary Peters, the mother of Deanie Peters, who said that more than anything, she just wants to know where her daughter's remains are, so that she can bring her home. When I started working on this documentary, I wondered if uh, this was the right time to tell the story. After all, the case had been cold for 40 years. But then everything changed on July 2nd, 2021, where suddenly it was announced that an arrest had been made in this case. James Frisbee was arrested on charges of perjury and resisting arrest. And it seemed like for once, justice was gonna prevail, that answers were finally going to be revealed. Someone who knew something had been arrested. And the Facebook page caught on fire for a few weeks. And then the charges were appealed and the trial was delayed. And still a year later after that arrest, residents were still hungry for justice when this documentary was filmed. As of today, James Frisbee has yet to stand trial and no further arrests have been made. Now Without the Trace tells the story of a community rocked by the disappearance of a young girl, someone who had a bright future and is remembered by countless people as beautiful and friendly and a lover of a meatloaf album. Residents have raised their children like me in the shadow of this tragedy and know those children are told not to go to the bathroom alone and to always keep one eye open for danger and are grappling with a world where a 14-year-old girl can just disappear and those who have answers are choosing to die with the knowledge of where her remains are. 
What's important for audiences to take away from this documentary is not just that Deanie Peters disappeared on February 1981, but she disappeared not without a trace. Thank you. Hi, I've got a question for you. You said your principal photography is done and you're in post, is that correct? Yes, I'm currently in the final stages of post-production. Mm -hmm. So you have no plans to go back to Michigan to shoot anymore? Uh, no, that's not my current plan, no. Unless I expanded this into something bigger. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm just wondering if you've, in your editing process, are you editing? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you've found places where you'll need to fill in or if you're really you feel like you got it all I think I got most of it I uh, one regret of mine was that I was not able to film inside the middle school uh, where she disappeared however I was able to acquire um, news footage that does have those interior shots and so I was able to employ that um, but mostly my focus was on how it's affected the local community and I was able to get plenty of footage of that that unfortunately was not shown today because this is only a segment of my final film um, but I, I believe I was able to get enough to piece together uh, the story that I want to tell. Thank you. Um, I, really, I really like your use of, of audio um, at the beginning. Um, I'm a big fan of, of that and how you can really use audio to enhance. Um, even if you don't see the person's face on screen, um, it, it's really something about that, especially when it's like a true crime type of thing. Um, how, how do you plan on using um, that type of thing throughout like the use of audio um, throughout the project? Definitely. So I am very lucky that my very talented friend, Nick Espreya, he is doing all my audio post-production mixing. So uh, he's been using a mixture of the natural sound that I captured on set, as well as all the interview audios. Uh, and he's also composing some really beautiful music to help um, aid in telling the story. And um, luckily, I was able to get talking head interviews with all my subjects, uh, minus Mary Peters, who now currently um, lives outside of Phoenix, Arizona. And she decided it would be better for her to do a phone interview. Um, but luckily, he's my friend Nick is in the process of cleaning that up to make it sound a little bit better. But mm -hmm. I was going to ask about that. I wonder if you thought about doing, you know, getting a tape sync where someone can record her on, like where she is, and send you the audio so that it wouldn't be phone tape. Is that something you've thought about, or I considered it? Um, mm -hmm. But in my discussions with Mary Peters, uh, she was hesitant to be a part of this project at the beginning, and I, I honored that as much, but after talking with her several times, she finally agreed, and I knew her voice would be really important in this project. I considered that, but she also said how much appearing on TV for so long uh, had affected her, and so I wanted to honor her and not put pressure on her to do more than she was comfortable with, and so I personally went with the decision of just featuring her voice, but in future projects, it's definitely something I would consider. What do you think um, her legacy is? That's a great question. Um, I think in a lot of cases in the community, um, she has kind of lifted up as a hallmark of this was a moment where our town fundamentally, fundamentally changed. Because uh, I talked to many people, including my dad, who all said that they felt like they grew up in the suburban utopia, that everything was safe and everything was wonderful, and they were able to play outside, and now, they saw that as a moment where everything changed and they realized that this town was not as safe as they thought it was and especially the continued lack of answers and the continued lack of stepping forward by individuals who have answers. I think that that is really unfortunate that that's her legacy because she does seem like a wonderful young woman um, who had a lot of potential and unfortunately I think that's what her legacy has been reduced to. But also as a part of my film I really wanted to show what Houdini was, and I tried to show that through interviews with Kathy Weeks Kingma and Mary Peters, and I hope that this film can at least show that that's part of her legacy too, that she was uh, just a 14-year-old girl, and she deserved to be able to grow up and have a future, and that was unfortunately taken from her. Um, you know, w when you do documentaries, you know, we're always thinking about, you know, the impact that we want to have, and, you know, an impact campaign, and doing stuff like that. Have you thought about you know, when this film is done, I know you want to do festivals, of course, <laughs> but outside of festivals, have you thought about doing some type of impact campaign uh, with this story in, in, in the film? Absolutely. I am actually in the process of planning a screening in Grand Rapids right now, a community screening that also features some of my participants. So I'm in the midst of getting that scheduled. Um, and 
yeah, that's um, kind of what I've been thinking about in terms of impact. Uh, obviously, there's a big community around this story and a lot of people who remember Dini, um, but I would also love to be able to make use of that Facebook page, which is still active, to show this documentary and hopefully allow people to come together and share more stories of Dini. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. I was a little confused when you were talking about her remains. Was mm -hmm. her body actually found? No, it has not. Um, it, it's uh, getting, without getting into the weeds of uh, case details, um, it is very highly suspected that she was killed that day, um, and those who did it, whether it was an accident or on purpose, disposed of her body, um, likely in a swamp nearby in kind of the rural part of Grand Rapids, uh, of the area outside. Um, so individuals know that her remains are out there, they just don't know the exact location, and the site where it's likely her remains are is very, very dense swamp. So there has not been able to do a, um, an advanced search without the knowledge of exactly where her remains are. Did you get a lot of B-roll of the community when you were there, just driving around? I did, actually, it's funny you say driving because I did get a lot of footage um, out of a moving car, which gave me some really awesome kind of driving uh, shots of the area, and those are included throughout the film, just not in this section uh, that I chose to show today. Do you have footage from the 80s of the community as well, just around town? I did try to locate that. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find much in the archival sites I looked at. Um, I found a couple of photos um, that I um, decided, kind of figured whether or not to include, um, but unfortunately there wasn't a ton of footage I was able to locate. And I'm assuming all, Mary provided all the photos that you were using at the beginning? Of Indirectly. Um, so those were actually posted to the Facebook page, but um, mm -hmm. Brent Ashcroft, who runs that page and was featured in my documentary, um, he uh, got those from, I believe, uh, Mary Peters' husband, who unfortunately has passed away. I do, I do really like the way it opened with just photos and a voice. I thought that was a really strong opening. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was definitely something important to me to show that uh, who Deanie Peters was before introducing her as a missing person. That, yeah, she was a 14-year-old girl before she disappeared and kind of rocked this community. All right. Thank you so much. Here's my clipboard. You can lose anything anywhere. Um, that was Emily Prinz, Elon University. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Next up, we turn to the University uh, of North Carolina School of the Arts, and we welcome Aidan Winter Dealey to talk about the film Print is Dead, a documentary about the decline of the publishing industry. Hi, good afternoon, thank you for having us. Um, I'm Aiden Winterdeely, and this is Meg Fisher, and we are the co-creators of the feature film, Print is Dead. Um, thank you for having us, yeah. So, uh, one of the most important inventions was the printing press, and today, print is a medium that is a way to document history, and it has been for centuries. Ideas and culture are spread through print books. Um, but unfortunately, with the rise of digital media, print has declined and we're seeing that throughout the industry. Our documentary, Print is Dead, will explore the history and decline of the print publishing industry, specifically book publishing industry, um, and how that has impacted the variety of books and ideas being published today. What we found when making our short documentary, Bestseller, which explores the New York Times bestsellers list and its curation, is that this is an industry-wide problem. It's not just the Times, it's the whole book publishing industry. Um, and we really need to explore it in a feature rather than a short. Uh, there's far too much to cover. The bestsellers list is just one part. So in this feature, we're gonna dive into a lot of the issues that the industry is facing, such as layoffs, uh, booksellers are struggling to stay afloat, and authors are not making enough money to keep the lights on. Um, this winter, uh, when we were in New York City filming bestseller, we were witnesses to the HarperCollins Publishers Union strike. We spoke with Stephanie Guerdon for our documentary, who is a, an associate editor at HarperCollins Children's, 
and they talked to us about what their demands were. And during that strike, which lasted 66 workdays, HarperCollins actually announced that it would be reducing its North American workforce by 5%. At the end of the strike, the union actually secured what they were looking for, but that was only a pay raise for entry-level positions to $47,500 a year, which when you think about it, it might sound like a lot of money, but in New York, it's not. Um, while the book publishing industry itself is struggling, so are booksellers. So we're dealing with, um, you know, Barnes & Noble was acquired in 2019 by Waterstones, and their new strategy is prioritizing TikTok viral books and bestsellers over new releases and the diverse range of books that we used to see when Borders was open and we had more competition in the retail chain area. Uh, Amazon is quickly becoming the number one bookseller in the US, and they sell their books at a loss, at sometimes up to 40% off new releases, and that directly impacts what the author is making off of those books, because when the book is sold on sale, the author makes less in royalties. These authors are only being paid $5,000 on average in advance for their debut novels already, and they're usually not earning those advances out. They're averaging, as we saw, about $20,000 a year in median income, which is not livable. We really care about this industry, and I work in it. This is why this is such an important topic to me. I'm an intern at a literary agency, and every day I'm reading amazing books, but they're not getting published. There's not enough agents, there's not enough editors, there's not enough money. But I care so deeply about seeing this industry stay afloat, and that's why I want to make this feature. We have a lot of footage from bestseller, like so much more than we could use in our 15 minute doc. Um, that we will use in this feature, and we want to go back, re-interview some of those subjects, and I had more subjects than we could fit in a 15-minute doc reach out as well. So I would love to return to them. We had Brady McReynolds, who's the COO of Jabberwocky Literary, um, talk with us in this. Uh, Stephanie Guerdon, uh, we had a few authors who reached out, but we ended up interviewing H.E. Edgman, who is incredibly talented. Um, and then we had local bookmarks bookseller Caleb Masters in the doc. Um, but we also had people reach out from all over the place. So honestly, the reason we're pitching this doc is because print is so important to us. Print books are permanent, and it's not just about the individual. It's not about the author, the reader, the agent, the editor. This is global. We want print books to stay so that we can continue sharing history and continue documenting it for years to come. Thank you. I have a question, so I'll begin. Um, it sounds like the focus of your feature that you want to make is about the infrastructure more so than the technological advances. Like I'm thinking e-readers, audible.com, AI, chatbots turning in manuscripts. Like I want to know if that's going to be a part of your feature or if it isn't. Hi, I didn't, I didn't get introduced, but I'm uh, Meg Fisher. Um, and I was lucky enough to edit bestseller and I'll be the editor on this feature um, and what's really exciting is I kind of want us in our interviews to go out and get them to talk about what they're passionate about what they see the biggest threats to their spots in the industry because we're trying to go from publishing to booksellers to authors and just see what their concerns about what they think the problems are and discover the narrative in the edit because that's my favorite part <laughs> is I like getting all these stories and then figuring out what's the cohesive look at what's going on in the industry. So since I was kind of limited in this trailer to what we already got for bestseller, um, I put things that might be in there. We might talk about self-publishing, we might talk about these mergers, we might talk about just dwindling shelf space, which is very much a thing. Barnes & Noble's almost turned into a gift store at this point. Um, so that's something I would love to talk about, the, the problems with AI chatbots and the, uh, the problems with Audible barely paying authors anything and also dominating the audiobook market. But um, I really want it to come out in the interviews personally. Um, and I see a structure where we're beginning with the history and then coming into the present day and the consequences of the digital age taking over print. Um, I also work in journalism for newspapers, so I'm seeing this in like all of the jobs I work in, and I very I care very much about print staying. Um, 
and since I know this is, this is a feature length documentary, um, what is your, um, I guess, what's your budget? And also, like, what's your, your fundraising plan as well, um, pursuing, you know, a feature length documentary? And yeah, how do you want to raise the money for it? What's your plan for it? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we've completed post-production on bestseller. So my strategy going into this is to pitch and seek funding at as many of the film festivals that we will attend with that film as possible and get grants that way. And I, I mean, we made bestseller for a few thousand dollars. We went to New York City, we had a crew of six. Um, I produced and directed. Um, and I've learned to be pretty thrifty with a budget. I feel like we can really pull this off with maybe $10,000. We already have so much footage. Um, and it would really just be about traveling to New York to get more in-person interviews. Um, but I'm not afraid of Zoom interviews either. They've definitely come more mainstream since COVID. We saw some footage of the strike that you mentioned. What are some of the visual elements of this story? So we're kind of unsure for the feature, but Bestseller was a hybrid animation doc film. And it was kind of done in the style of like a Vox video or, um, or you know, kind of lean into the digital journalism with like very simple After Effects graphics and stuff. So we did that with a lot of our like numbers, a lot of our graphs, you know, illustrating where data comes from and stuff. So that could be a very strong visual component of this feature. I feel like it could add a lot of character to it. Um, but on top of that, I'm a big fan of archival footage, you know. Um, we also used in bestseller, because a lot of people talk about the bestseller list, it's the most popular kind of thing to look to. We used a lot of like tweets, we used a lot of people talking online, because that's really easy to find. Um, so I think, even though we're making a documentary about print media, I think using digital spaces and just how you can see globally how people react to something would be a good through line for it. Yeah, definitely continuing with the Vox style animation. I was the animator as well, and I love incorporating animation into my documentary projects. Um, and the visual style I've been using throughout like the marketing of Bestseller as well. I just want to keep those two and evolve Bestseller into this feature. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about that. I'm wondering about fair use. And I think I'll just let you talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can. So we, all of the footage we used is fair use. Um, we had a lawyer assess. Um, and I mean, we're at School of the Arts, so I have professors who were able to connect us with people who helped us out with that. Um, and that is what part of the budget will go to, as well as, you know, we had an amazing composer who I would like to continue having music from. And um, yeah. So fair use for sure uh, is a big component of the archival footage that we will be accessing. We are not planning to license anything outright if we don't have to. Um, that was Aiden Winter Dealey, and I'm sorry, was that Meg Fisher? Was, was yes. Yes. Thank you both um, from uh, UNC School of the Arts. Um, <laughs> finally, we have a representative from Wake Forest University, Taylor Rogers, is here to talk about the film Types. phone with my baby sister Sophie as you saw um, getting caught up on all of the latest middle school drama um, when the conversation drifted towards our mom our mom passed away when Sophie was five and I was 18 uh, when we were on the phone I asked her how much do you remember of mama and her response I don't really remember anything is what brings me here today my family is just one of the millions that is affected by the grief and loss that comes with a diabetes diagnosis. If everybody will look to their left and then to their right. Studies show that one of the three of you is pre-diabetic and doesn't even know it yet. 
Ranked as the seventh leading cause of death in the US, it is an epidemic that is consuming our country, and yet it is still being brushed off as a curable disease as long as you diet and exercise. As an older sister to Sophie, I feel like it's my responsibility that she knows who her mom is, and also about the disease that killed her. And as a filmmaker, I'm committed on shedding a light to this misunderstood and, quite frankly, underestimated disease. My film Types is an observational short documentary that shares my family's life as it was ruled by this insidious illness from the very first day of my mom's diagnosis until her early death at the age of 44. As Sophie watches videos of her mom for the very first time in her life, you'll learn how a single mom balanced the cost of doctor's appointments with the needs and wants of her kids. And when the financial choice came down between doctor's visits and our field trips, we both went on the field trips. But as I said, though, diabetes touches many lives. And while this film will show how my family grieves the loss of a loved one when the disease gets upper hand, it'll also tell the stories about how other women meet the challenge of living with this illness. So we'll meet Lisa. She's a middle-aged type 2 diabetic that was recently diagnosed, as well as a single mom of two kids. She's a small woman with bright red hair that matches her personality and her love for life. We sit with Lisa as she visits doctors and anxiously awaits test results, as well as learns how to manage her new glucose monitoring system. And we see in this new life that she has, all of the crazy schedules and checks and balances that's a stark contrast to her personality. She also explains to us the hum humiliation she felt when she was first diagnosed. And honestly, that's why she agreed to be a part of this film. Oftentimes, we aren't kind to diabetics. Society and the media blame the diabetic themselves not genetics, not inequity, it's because they're lazy. Now, Lisa sees herself as an advocate. Next, Kiana. She's an empowered black woman that seeks to thrive despite systemic and genetic odds stacked against her. Her mom also died of type 1 diabetes just last year. She's a 26-year-old type 1 diabetic that was diagnosed at the age of 7. So she's an old pro at this. We follow her as she does diabetic math at the grocery store converting carbs into insulin as she gives herself shots effortlessly, and as she explains how the high cost of insulin forced her to ration her medication in order to survive. Like Lisa, Kiana is also an advocate, but for herself. You see, her diabetes has never once been treated by somebody who looks like her. Is that why she has to fight so hard to receive the care that she truly deserves? I see part of myself and Sophie and Kiana and I see part of my mom and Lisa. And by sharing all of our stories, I know that this film will shed light on misconceptions and start the conversation of prevention. I know firsthand that awareness saves lives, so I will leave here with this. I urge all of you to please go get your blood sugars checked. Thank you. A family friend of mine just had a his lower leg amputated because of diabetes. And I have often thought for years, this is a really underreported subject. So yeah. sorry to hear that. Thank you. And I, but I'm, and I'm really glad you're exploring this. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what kind of footage you have so far. We saw a glimpse, but absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, this film is, is a combination, um, uh, of, of a few different types of footage. Um, as I, I said, it is, uh, majority archival as I follow um, Kiana through her life and uh, Lisa at doctor's appointments and, and in very private settings. Um, thank, thankfully, my father was an avid um, uh, videographer at home, so I have just too many hours of VHS um, footage of my mom um, at, and I as a child um, and when she was diagnosed as well. So. My goal is to try to keep her alive in a way through this archival material as I'm also weaving in this observational footage um, and honestly a little bit of reflexive footage as well um, since me and my sister are involved in this. Um, yeah, I really like this. Um, you know, I'm a type two diabetic, you know, myself got diagnosed, you know, a few years ago and, you know, Took a long time <laughs> to, to kind of come to grips with that. But um, with this project, 
I know, you know, you're going to have those characters where you have, like, maybe some medical people um, on camera as well to kind of talk about, you know, the ins and outs of this, of this and some of the, the prevention as well. Yeah, I, I think that's um, a, a great question because, um, you know, a lot of times what we have seen um, in diabetes is a lot of these doctors, I know that they mean well, but they're come off as very preachy. Um, and it's oftentimes been these doctors talking to people who have diabetes rather than the diabetics themselves. And so um, although this film is about awareness and advocacy, it's also um, a, a chance for the diabetics themselves to, to share their own story. And through that, in a way, I, I think it becomes um, more clear to the layman people of what this disease is because really it's just, you know, your pancreas is broke. Um, so uh, they, uh, I think they're able to explain it better than, you know, maybe a, um, a, a doctor might. And uh, I also have been very lucky enough to have a connection with the American Diabetes Association. Um, one of my scenes is at a, um, it's called Tour de Cure. It's a cycling fundraising event um, for the cure for diabetes. And, um, fantastic woman there has been a, a great resource um, for advocacy and um, to really get the facts right. This is a short doc, right? You, do you have a estimated length? I'm, I'm aiming for um, 30 minutes. Um, and I, I realize that that may seem a little bit challenging, um, but I, I'm choosing around 30 minutes purposefully. Um, I feel um, like it helps with accessibility and really able to get this out to as many people as possible. And I think the longer that you make it, the, the narrower your audience becomes. Um, yeah, accessibility around 30 minutes, hopefully. Do you have any ideas for graphics or graphic style? Yeah, um, so my uncle, um, my uh, mom's brother, actually is a graphic design artist. Um, uh, he wasn't in, in Colorado, but I meet with him weekly just to chit-chat about life, but also to talk about graphics. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, best of both worlds. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky to have him on my team, and obviously he wants to do as much as he can for this project and for his sister. Um, what are your plans for distribution with it, um, with, with this project? You know, how do you see yourself putting it out there in the world? And I guess what channels or you know mm -hmm. platforms or other entities do you want to really showcase this project? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, I want to prioritize um, film festivals along the southeast because that's primarily where the um, stroke and diabetes belt lie. Um, so I, I think that's my primary film festival audience. But obviously, would love to go nationwide as it is um, and international wide if, if, I, if that happens. Um, and as I said, I also have a, a contact at the ADA um, and each metropolitan city in the United States has a uh, diabetes uh, or ADA chapter within them. So I would love to do um, lots of community screenings um, there and also at Tour de Cure next year and you know possibly years after that because some of their you know, participants are, are in the film. Um, and then also, uh, you know, we're in the best place in the world for um, showing our medical documentaries because, you know, Wake Forest, the Triangle area, there's heaps of medical schools. Um, so I would love to be able to inform our future physicians of America, <laughs> um, you know, what their patients go through and uh, maybe it'll open their eyes a little bit. Um, you talked about wanting to keep the memory of your mom alive mm -hmm. and then also about Kiana's story and, and seeking treatment from people who don't look like her. How do you imagine um, combining those narratives? Yeah, that, that's a great question and, and one I've given a lot of thought to um, as I think of weaving our stories together. Um, I, I plan on leaning on the similarities that we have. You know, Lisa is a, a single mom of two kids, so is my mom. Um, Kiana lost her mom um, to, to, as a, a child of diabetes as well. Um, and then I also think of it as um, not in the three-act structure in the sense of, of that narrative, but the progression of the disease itself. So um, Lisa is in the beginning of diabetes. She was just diagnosed. Kiana is an old pro. She, she's very uh, 
proficient in the world of diabetes. And then my mom is, um, unfortunately, what happens if uh, the disease wins. Um, so I think leaning on that as well, um, and then using my archival video as much as possible as uh, transitions between um, all three stories. Sorry. <laughs> what are the locations that you were shooting in? The locations? Yeah. Um, so all of North Carolina, I'm, I'm very happy to say. Um, Lisa's based in Winston-Salem. Um, Kiana in Greensboro. She was actually my uh, roommate in undergrad. <laughs> um, and then uh, all, most of my family is based in um, Charlotte, North Carolina. So very close. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, welcome back. Um, I was thinking about documentary films last night in, in uh, the, the world of AI, and I, I got to think about, well, what happens if we have an AI device make a documentary about an AI device making a documentary, and, <laughs> and my brain broke, um, and I'm just so uh, happy to be in a room full of humans today uh, and hearing about your, your very human stories. <laughs> Um, so uh, I, I believe that the, uh, the winners today, we have a first place winner is going to get $1,000 and uh, uh, a second place winner is going to get $500 toward the completion of their film. So uh, congratulations to all four of you. Like I said, I can't wait to see all of them. Uh, uh, with that, let's, let's turn things over to our, our jurists and, and hear about their thoughts. Um, I'm so impressed by all of your pitches, and thank you so much. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll just take it. Yeah, I'll just hold it. And thank you so much for. I think it takes a lot of courage to get up here and 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 make this pitch. So thank you for doing it. We wanted to provide some feedback about each of the pitches in order of how we heard them. So um, Hugo Ever After, or is Bella? Oh, sorry, okay, yeah. Sorry, I'm a little short. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I, we, uh, you know, I, as someone with an archival background, I just kind of fell in love with the, the visuals of this film. I think it is um, such a, uh, a great, it, it is such a great um, resource that you have these, these visual um, archival material to work with, and it's fun. This is a fun story. It, it does have an emotional element to it, no question, but, um, but there's, there's just so much uh, playfulness in the story of your dad that um, made someone who uh, doesn't know much about sports feel really drawn to this story. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Bella. Um, Emily, right, without a trace? Um, Emily, thank you so much for your pitch. It was very confident and well presented. I think you have a very clear idea of the film that you're making and the story that you're telling. Um, I loved your video presentation, um, the element, the, the, the images with the voiceover. Um, I think keeping the community and the impact of this death on the community at the forefront is gonna be really helpful um, for you moving forward. So that the fact that you've made an ethical guidebook moving forward is really impressive. And I, I hope that you share that with the rest of your filmmaker community. And in fact, I would like to also have <laughs> access to it as well. <laughs> I think it's, it's really, really cool that you did that. Um, and I'm also going to talk about Print is Dead. Uh, we, I love the original story. I, it's something that I've never seen a documentary about, and I don't think people are talking about it quite enough. I mean, um, you have a wonderful professionalism and poise in your pitch. Um, I like how much you plan to incorporate the, the visual aspect. It's a really interesting line that you're towing between bringing on a, a like a 
digital graphic element into a documentary that's about the dying medium of print. And so just it's really commit to it and be really consistent in that um, so that it works. <laughs> I think that will be a challenge. Um, and I love that you had a lawyer review for fair use. I think that's very, very important. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to you to talk about our last film. Um, yeah, um, types. Um, it was a good pitch. Um, also, you know, the original original idea, the story, you know, it's something that we a lot of us can relate to, but we never really seen anyone, you know, kind of do a documentary on the subject around diabetes. Um, so yeah, we definitely love the originality of the idea and the story, um, and also your personal connection to it as well. Um, I think also the potential that the project has, especially for impact um, campaigns and screenings, um, to really move the project forward, has a, a lot of potential um, for that as well. So. So now we'll announce the winners. I suppose we'll start with second place. Second place is going to print is dead. <laughs> Should I? Yes. Do you want to announce? Want to announce first place? <laughs> All right, first place is going to types. <laughs> 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 